so uh, ladies and gentlemen how are you today i hope we are all fine i have been having a lot of uh, demands from students especially to guide them through a number of course units so i do not have time to meet you physically but i think we shall be able to uh, to meet uh, by giving you some of these videos to take you through uh, a number of course units uh, for today, we shall go through evidence law. Uh, I'll take you through evidence law one. And we shall start with uh, one of the topics that I guess any student of the law in law school should uh, be able to appreciate very well. So I will be taking you through one of your topics for today. And uh, later on, I'll be releasing other videos to take you through other topics. But for today, I will take you through evidence law. Uh, one and specifically the topic of hearsay evidence uh, but before I take you through hearsay evidence I wanted to refer to you uh, a number of uh, textbooks that you have to read for your own personal uh, enrichment uh, at least a student of law should always have the evidence act close to him ensure that you have your constitution next to you and uh, there are some uh, very good textbooks that you can also refer to. Uh, these include uh, Adrian Keane and Paul. That is the modern law of evidence. Uh, you can get any edition, uh, but preferably the latest edition. Uh, there is also evidence law in East Africa. You can also get that. Uh, then there is the, uh, the textbook of Morris. Uh, there is the textbook of Morris, HF. Uh, evidence in East Africa. It's also a very good one. Uh, also refer to other textbooks such as Cross and Tapa Evidence Law. Any edition can always work. And so many other textbooks. Uh, for the Ugandan version, uh, you can also refer to Ochola. Uh, that is the East, African, the East African Law of Evidence and so many other textbooks. But always ensure you have your Evidence Act, your Constitution, always have uh, your cases right and you'll be ready to go so ladies and gentlemen again i remind you to subscribe to my channel and uh, you can like these videos in case you find them of, of help to you um, thank you very much so we shall start immediately with our topic of hearsay evidence so hearsay evidence is very important uh, topic to grasp especially the principles governing it because it's very important uh, for any advocate to, to know what amounts to hearsay evidence. Otherwise, you would not make a good lawyer because you'll have many challenges. So today, let's look at hearsay evidence uh, so that we are able to understand the most important principles governing hearsay evidence. So uh, first of all, uh, we have to first appreciate the definition. And uh, there are so many definitions uh, of hearsay evidence. But under common law, hearsay evidence has been defined as a third party's assertions narrated to court by witness for the purpose of establishing the truth of that which was asserted. So here we are looking at a situation where uh, there is a witness that is before court and uh, they are narrating in form of evidence uh, assertions of another party. So they did not either experience them with their eyes or, or hear them by themselves and they end up appearing before court to give evidence. So these are what we refer to as uh, hearsay pieces of evidence. So that is under common law. But under Ugandan law, uh, the v Evidence Act, uh, when you read under section 59, it clearly establishes the general rule that governs hearsay evidence. Uh, uh, and uh, when you read under that section, uh, it provides for the general rule that oral evidence must, in all cases, whatever, the issue be direct. So in case a witness comes to give oral evidence, it must be direct evidence. That is the general rule under section 59. There is case law that has supported uh, this position under Ugandan law. Uh, I invite you to look at the case of Sparks versus R, uh, 1964, SC, 
uh, page 964. This case is uh, a, a very good case for any student to look at. Uh, it brings out, it clearly illustrates uh, what amounts to hearsay if it is. And in summary, the holding of court uh, in, in Sparks versus R was that evidence by the mother of what the girl had said to her was inadmissible. So basically what happened is that um, there, there was, there was uh, the, the accused was suspected for having committed rape. And uh, uh, the child on whom the rape was done uh, told the mother that indeed the same had happened. And it was the mother that was before court to try and narrate uh, saying that, you know, she was told by the, the daughter. So court said that, no, this amounted to hearsay evidence uh, because it was another party's assertions uh, being put uh, before court. So this case illustrates very clearly the principle um, of, of hearsay. Uh, also, when you look under section 59, it's important to note that under section 59E and F, okay, this provides for the exceptions to section 59A to D. Okay, specifically this is under the Evidence Act of Uganda. So if you are from another country, you may realize that the sections could be a bit different, but I'm very sure if you're under the common law, then uh, they should not be so far away different. So basically that is the general rule. Grasp the general rule and also it's important for a student to know or any person interested in legal knowledge to understand that uh, the general rule has exceptions. So meaning that there are circumstances where uh, hearsay would be, would be admissible by court. And those exceptions under the Ugandan Evidence Act are provided for under Section 30. Okay, Section 30 provides for the exceptions and specifically statements of person who cannot be called as witnesses. So there are certain circumstances where statements of persons that cannot be called as witnesses before court will be admissible even where they ordinarily amount to hearsay evidence. So we shall proceed to look at those exceptions uh, which fall under the first category uh, of cases that are admissible as exceptions. So when you look under your act, uh, you will find all those sections, uh, all those exceptions under section 30. But most importantly, before we can look at each of them in detail, it's important to, to, to appreciate, however, that statements under this section to be admissible as evidence, it is necessary that. So if court is going to admit these as exceptions to the general rule governing hearsay, they have to fulfill a number of, uh, of, of, uh, of criteria. Okay? The first one is that the person who made them is dead. Okay? So the person who made that statement is either deceased, okay? then court will go on to admit the exceptions or cannot be found okay the second uh, circumstance could be that the person who made those statements uh, which amount to hearsay evidence cannot be found at a certain time then court would admit them or has become incapable of giving evidence okay there are situations where a person becomes incapable of giving evidence for example circumstances under section 117 of the evidence act okay amount to such uh, circumstances or the other the other fourth uh, uh, the other fourth point that falls under those requirements is that where someone whose attendance cannot be procured without such delay there is someone required to give evidence but probably it will take a long time okay or expenses as the court considers unreasonable the expense to transport a witness could be extremely high Take an example where a witness is in a foreign country, which is probably far from the country where evidence is supposed to be given. So in such circumstances, uh, court will go on to accept uh, hearsay evidence. Okay, So it's very important for a student to note that for the exceptions under Section 30, as we are talking about, for court to admit them, there has to be at least one of the four factors that I have hinted about. This is very important for uh, students to, to appreciate. So having, uh, having understood that, 
we now proceed to look at some of the exceptions. We are looking at circumstances where uh, hearsay evidence will be admissible by, by court. Uh, first of all, uh, again, under Section 30, Clause, uh, clause 1, uh, you look at, uh, for example, the exception where statement, uh, statements as to the cause of death. So that is the first exception. But before we go in detail, at this stage, it's also very important for, for, for a student to know that these exceptions are in two categories. Okay, This is very important to note from the onset. The first category are statements made by persons who cannot be called as witnesses. Okay, That is the first category. But there is also another category of exceptions, which are statements made under special circumstances. Okay, those are the two categories of exceptions. But for now, we are going to first look at statements made by persons who cannot be called as witnesses. Okay, and those are the ones that specifically fall under section 30. Okay, I think it's section 30. A to should be, I think, up to F. You can uh, cross check with your evidence act. So we shall start first with looking at that category. So the first exception are statements made as to the cause of death. Okay, Someone makes a statement as to what has killed another. Okay, That statement ordinarily is hearsay. But we are saying that this is an exception, meaning that even when it's hearsay, in, it will be admissible by court. That is the first exception. But it's important to note that in our Ugandan context, unlike in England, where dying declarations are admissible, only in causes, in cases of murder and manslaughter. In East Africa and in Uganda, and in Uganda in particular, admissibility is not restricted to such cases, okay? No, indeed, only to criminal cases, but extends to civil cases. So we are seeing uh, the difference, okay, between the Ugandan case and the British case, okay? So that is very important for any student to note. Secondly, in England, a dying declaration is only admissible as an exception to hearsay if the person making it was at the time in actual expectation of death. Okay, this is the second difference. In East Africa, and in Uganda in particular, this is, however, not the position. The position is that, in Uganda here, such statements are relevant whether or not they were made under expectation of death. Okay, they are relevant where the person was expecting to die by the time they made such a statement or not it will still be relevant so this can be contrasted with the english or uh, the position in the uk so let's look at a number of cases uh the Spires jasunga son of akumu versus r please go and look at this case it's 1954 uh, 21 yaka page 331 Go and look at that case. It illustrates very well what happened. But briefly, in this case, an assistant inspector of police gave evidence that uh, on that day he saw the deceased on the road with a wound in his chest. So this was a police inspector uh, who gave evidence. When asked, he replied, he replied that he was stabbed by the accused in the hospital. Okay. Later, the deceased made a statement to the AI of the police by way of question and answer, but he, however, never signed it and died the next day. Court held, among others, that there is no rule of law that to support a conviction, there must be a corroboration of the dying declaration. But it's generally a very good practice, okay, that, and, uh, that the same should be corroborated. And court allowing it without corroboration is unsafe. Um, to convict a person solely or only on uncorroborated evidence. Then secondly, court also held that um, a dying declaration in form of questions and answers was admissible. So we are seeing again the operation of the exception. Okay, So court here admitted uh, hearsay evidence in form of statements concerning a deceased person. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, corroboration is not necessary where the accused could not have been mistaken as to his assailant. Remember we say that it's unsafe to convict uh, 
uh, solely on uncorroborated evidence of the dying declaration. But we are saying that there are certain circumstances where it is um, to be safe, okay? And this is uh, where the accused could not have been mistaken as to his assailant. Please, for that position, go and look at the case of R versus Eligu, son of Odell, and Ipungu, son of Iwunyu. Uh, that is the case of 1943, uh, uh, volume 10, Yaka, page 90. You go and look at that case, it will elaborate very well uh, that exception. Court can base on circumstantial evidence to convict um, on, a, on, a, on a dying declaration. So yes, we are saying that there are circumstances where court will also can consider circumstantial evidence to convict um, uh, on a dying declaration. Again, uh, for, for authority, one look at the case of Ara versus Said, son of Abdullah alias Said, son of Mangombe. It's a case of 1945, volume 12, Yaka, page 67. One look at that case, it will clearly illustrate that principle. Uh, the other point to note also is that corroboration can be found in the accused's conduct. Okay, So we are saying that corroboration, the principle of corroboration that we have been talking about, it can also be implied, it can also be picked okay, from the accused's conduct. How the accused conducts themselves, okay, we can pick uh, the aspect of corroboration. So we can corroborate a dying declaration from how the accused person is behaving, from his conduct, his demeanor, his actions. Okay, we can pick the aspect of corroboration, okay, from the accused conduct. Look at the case of Mibunga versus Uganda. It's a case of 1965, East Africa, page 71. This case clearly illustrates, okay, this principle. And the trial court found in this case in the facts that on the first occasion when the deceased uh, accused Mibunga in his presence of being his assailant, Mibunga remain, remained silent. So courts concluded that the silence of the accused when he was accused of, have, of having committed the offense, his silence, okay, amounted to a conduct that um, court used to corroborate the aspect of of a dying uh, declaration or the, the or such statements. So uh, again, um, certainty of a dying declaration will determine the weight attached to it. So the certainty, court will also look at certainty okay, of a dying declaration. This is very, very important. So court will look at, at the same. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let us uh, proceed to look at the second exception which is under section 30, uh, subsection B of your Evidence Act. That provides for the second exception. This is These are statements made in the ordinary course of business. So they are statements that can be made in the ordinary course of, of business. Those are exceptions uh, to the principle of um, hearsay. So those will be admissible. Specifically, here we are looking at entries okay or memorandums they are entries that may be made during the course of business and in particular when it consists of any entry or memorandum made by him or her in the books kept in the ordinary course of business so during business there are certain entries that you may make in your books okay these would ordinarily amount to hearsay evidence but we are saying that they will be admissible by court okay as an exception to the principle of to the, to, the, to the general rule that we talked about under section 59 of the uh, Evidence Act. However, it's important for a student to note that for this uh, exception, okay, for it to apply, adm uh, to be admissible, those statements, okay, have to attain three key aspects. First, they must be contem Contemporaneous, okay? They must be contemporaneous. Those statements for court to admit them, okay, as hearsay evidence, they have to be 
contemporaneous. Secondly, they must be made by a person with no interest to misrepresent those facts. The person who made those entries in the books or in the memorandum must not have had an interest to misrepresent them. If a person had an interest to misrepresent them, then court will not allow them. Okay, court will not allow this exception. Then lastly, the maker had a duty. Okay, the maker, now here we're looking at the person who makes those statements into those books, must have had a duty, okay, to record those statements. In a case, this person did not have a duty. It was not their responsibility. Court will not admit or court will not allow this uh, exception. Uh, it is also important to note that those entries must not have been made in expectation of litigation. So in case these entries were made, expecting that in the future there will be litigation so that we rely on them, they will not be admitted by court. Okay, They will not be admitted by court. I invite you to look at the case of Idi Bin Ramadan uh, versus the Crown. Okay, This is a case of 1949. I'll go through the facts of this case because most of you may not be able to find this law report very easily. So in this case, uh, a police officer took part in an investigation of a charge. He then sought to put in as evidence a statement he had made earlier. It was held that though it may have been the duty of the constable, that is the police officer, to make the statement which he did, it was very clearly in the nature of a special statement made with a view to the present prosecution. So court refused this statement because the constable had made it in expectation okay, of, pros of present prosecution. He made it expecting that such, such statement would be used in the future. To negative his guilt okay or to take away liability so the same was denied okay uh, then there is also another good case you can look at that is the case of uh, R versus Magandazi and four others 1914 volume 2 Uganda law reports page 108 that's a very good case I invite you to go and look uh, for that case in the library uh, so that you're able to read it in detail. Let's look at the third exception, and that those are statements against the interests of the maker. So these ones are also admissible even when they are hearsay, okay? Because if a person makes statements, okay, that are against their own interest, then even when they are hearsay, court will admit them. Because normally, someone cannot make, you so if people are are people like themselves a lot, they care a lot about themselves. So by the time someone makes a statement that is against them, court takes it that indeed, even if this is a hearsay statement, it will be admissible, it will be admissible by court, it will be admitted, and this forms the third exception. Uh, look at the case of Taylor versus Witham, okay? It's a case of 1876, uh, volume 3, Chancellery, page 6. This case is uh, very authoritative. I'll briefly take you through the facts. The deceased in his will gave, uh, this is a case that tries to illustrate this exception under section 30, subsection C of the Ugandan Evidence Act. So in Taylor versus Witham, the deceased in his will gave legacies amounting to 31 pounds to certain members of his family and 4,000 pounds to certain members of the family of his deceased wife and a legacy of twenty thousand of two thousand pounds to James Witham. A question arose as to the legacy of two thousand pounds to Witham. There was proof as to the deceased entry into his private account book, which was not disputed. Court held that the statement must be against the maker's interests and that there was um, it was a, a matter of logic uh, to that effect. It was admitted basing on the deceased entries. So you again, we are seeing court um, applying okay, this exception. Uh, and this case clearly illustrates that. Uh, I also invite you to look at uh, the next exception, which is under section 30, uh, subsection D of the Ugandan Evidence Act. 
which provides for statements giving opinion as to public right. Okay, this is also uh, an exception. So when statements, when the statement gives the opinion of any such person as to the existence of any public right or custom or matter of public or general interest of the existence of which if it existed, he or she would have been likely to be aware. And when that statement was made before any controversy as to the right custom or matter had arisen. So in such circumstances, such statement will form uh, the exception uh, to, uh, to section 59. Uh, so I invite you, you can go and look at the case of Manji, Suleiman, and others versus R, uh, Petland, and others. This is a case of 1960, East Africa, HCT. Uh, that case will uh, clearly illustrate and bring out that principle very well. However, what is important to note uh, under this exception is that such a statement must have been made before any controversy as to the right or custom uh, arose. Public rights are those affecting a considerable section of the community. So for this exception to operate, it's important to note that uh, such statements must have, must have been made before and the controversy has to the right. If they are made after the controversy, then they will not be, admis, uh, they will not be admitted by, uh, by court. Let's proceed to look at uh, uh, our next exception, which is under Section 30, Clause E and F of the Evidence Act. So uh, this provides for statements in relation to the existence of any relationship by blood, marriage, or adoption. Okay, so these will also be admis, ad admitted by court as exceptions to the general rule. Okay, so when when statements uh, that relate to the existence of any relationship, such a relationship could be that one blood, maybe cousin, sister or father, or marriage, okay, or adoption between persons, such statements will be admissible in court. I invite you to look at the case of Hines versus Guthery, case of 1884, 53 LJQB, uh, 521. That case clearly illustrates um, that principle. Let's proceed and uh, we look at another exception under our law, and uh, that is under Section 30 uh, G of, of your Evidence Act. Again, I remind you, please kindly subscribe to my channel and like, and you should also share this video with your colleagues. This video has been made because of public demand and because of my inability to meet all of you. I have chosen to do it through this way so that you're able to, to have it in the comfort of your homes or classes or offices. Let's proceed to look at section 30 clause uh, G, uh, 30 G of the Evidence Act. This looks at statements in a deed, will or other documents. So there are statements that may be made ordinarily that amount to hearsay evidence. These statements could be made in a deed or will or any other document. Such statements will be admissible. Okay, they will be admissible uh, in court as an exception to the general rule. Okay, that hearsay evidence must in all situations be direct. Evidence must in all situations be direct. Uh, the other exception is under Section 30H. The evidence act this talks about statements made expressing feelings to the matter in question okay so these are also admissible by courts of law okay uh, please kind of look at them uh, maybe to explain this a little bit more uh, the meaning is that where a number of persons assemble together to give vent okay they, they, they give out their opinion on something to one common statement which expressed the feelings or expressions on their mind at the time of making it, 
that statement may be repeated by witnesses and is evidence that is admissible. I invite you to look at the case of Cook versus Ward. Okay, in this case, um, to prove that a libel, okay, referred to the plaintiff, evidence that he was publicly jeered at in consequence of the libel was held to be admissible. So, uh, in these circumstances, the plaintiff uh, adduced evidence to the effect that he was jeered at, okay, to show that indeed uh, there was a libel. And court admitted it under this exception. Let's proceed to look at um, section 31, which also provides the other exception. Um, and that provides for evidence given in judicial proceedings. So again, this forms the exception um, to, to section uh, 59. Uh, so here we are looking at evidence that is given by witness in judicial proceedings, okay? Or before any person authorized by law to take it. This is relevant, okay? It is relevant to a subsequent, but some judicial proceedings where the witness is dead cannot be found incapable of giving evidence. He or she is kept out of the way by the adverse party or he cannot be obtained without delay. So all those are the circumstances, okay? All those are the circumstances. I invite you to look at the case of Ndola versus R, 1926, uh, volume 10, KLR, page 11, this case will bring out uh, the... So the first exception that falls under the second category, which are statements made under special circumstances, is entries in books of accounts. That exception is provided for under section 32 of the Uganda Evidence Act. I invite you to go and read that section in detail. Uh, next are entries in public records. So entries made in public records also form the exception to the general rule and specifically look at section 33 of the Ugandan Evidence Act. The third exception uh, under that category are statements in maps, charts, and plans. So those statements made are an exception to the general rule. Specifically look at section 34 of the Ugandan Evidence Act. The other fourth exception. So ladies and gentlemen, I invite you uh, for purposes of section 31 of the Ugandan Evidence Act to look at the case of um, Ndola versus R, the case of 1926, volume 10, KLR, page 11, where it was held that the phase cannot be found referred to the time when the witness was sought to attend and did not refer to the state of affairs at some earlier period. Uh, to appreciate the principle very well, you have to go and uh, read this case in detail. Or you can also look at the case of Singh versus R, 1956, 23, Yaka, page 459, to illustrate this principle. So to illustrate that principle uh, more clearly, kind of look at that case, um, and you're able to read about it. Then secondly, we are now going to look at the exceptions, uh, which I called uh, the second part of exceptions. I had earlier, remember, when I was looking at the exceptions, I told you that these are divided into two. First, those are statements made by persons who cannot be called as witnesses. These are the ones that we have been looking at. So we now proceed to look at the second category of exceptions, and those are statements made under special circumstances. So there are statements that may be made under special circumstances. Those also form the exceptions to the general rule under section 59. Now, uh, briefly, I encourage you to go and look at them in detail, but I'll, however, run through them very fast. The other fourth exception includes statements in acts, gazettes, uh, etc. Uh, look at section 35 for that exception. And then lastly, uh, statements as to law contained in books. So those statements are also form an exception. Here we are looking at law books, law reports, etc. That is under section 36 of the Evidence Act. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. In case of any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, kindly subscribe to my channel and like and share with all your friends. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Conrad Mutiava. 
let's meet next time for another topic goodbye